I'm Dave Baker. And I'm Andrew Price. Welcome to Deep Cuts, a podcast where we pick a topic and walk you through the ins, the outs, and the nitty-gritty, so you can appear like an interesting and idiosyncratic person at your next forced social function. Today's topic is... Chuck Barris, international man of game show mystery. Who was Chuck Barris? Well, he was arguably the most successful game show program creator of all time, having birthed the newlywed game, the dating game, the gong show, and countless others. He was the toast of the 1960s and 1970s. But what if this seemingly offbeat creative type was actually a CIA operative? One, fact or fiction? Los Angeles is a town of smoke and mirrors. It's a place of perception. If there's a chance that someone else might want your idea, it immediately makes your idea more saleable. If there's a chance that someone might want you, you inherently become more valuable or more purchasable. Take your pick. Charles Hirsch Barris was born June 3rd, 1929, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. His father was a dentist and his mother was a homemaker. His uncle, Harry Barris, was a successful songwriter and actor. Decrowderated? <laughs> That's the, that is the worst typo you've ever done. Yep. <laughs> to the yep. point to the point where I'm like, I'm looking at it, I'm like, is this some kind of like old English word that nope. like was used in the past and it meant like dr- drugated it meant like when you when you beat your rugs too hard and it gives you a stomach ache <laughs> yeah, well yeah you know when you're making um when you're making pound cake you have to degrade it first <laughs> yeah no barris graduated in 1853 <laughs> it was graduated yep <laughs> Barris graduated in wait which Barris is this is that right 1853 is that right <laughs> <laughs> is that right I graduated with New Yorkers first job. no it was 1953 it's 1953 it's 1953 Barris this is did, did Andrew wrote this <laughs> Barris graduated in 1853 <laughs> This is how you know that we're back on our bullshit. We've we've left QAnon behind and we've re-embraced the the rampant typos. All right, all right, all right, all right. Barris graduated in 1953 from Drexel University, where he <laughs> held a, a regular column in his student newspaper, The Triangle. <laughs> After graduating, he moved to New York, where he got his first job as a page and later a staffer at NBC. After this job, he worked as a standards and practices person, which can you imagine knowing who Chuck Barris becomes? Chucky BB? Older to Chucky Beebs. Chucky Butterfinger BB. The fact that he was a standards and practices person is hilarious to me. He learned the fucking tricks of the trade. He learned what he learned how to how to push back and how to how to fill in the gaps. Fucking ridiculous. He quickly took up the practice of making music on the side while working in TV. He even wrote and produced music for various TV shows. His song, Palisades Park, even peaked at number three on the Billboard's Hot 100 in 1962. Eventually, Barris was promoted to daytime programming division of ABC and was responsible for determining what shows would air when. He was ostensibly a supervising producer that had kind of domain over specific schedules and kind of blocks of time he would kind of shift the shows around accordingly i want to talk about that for a second so in this in this time frame chuck barris was kind of just busking around kind of living that tom hansen life like i'm a i'm a really cocky uh white dude from the 70s 60s and 70s and i and i and i have this like devil may care attitude and I'm just going to go around like it's it's I mean, Tom Hansen is a bad example because Tom Hansen wasn't really successful. It, the, the the better description is George Lazenby. He had he had the George Lazenby energy. He's like, 
G'day, mate. I'm gonna just do whatever the fuck I want today and just keep doing that for the rest of my life until I'm old and sad because I squandered my youth being a raconteur and not actually carving out a niche for myself. Um, and at this at this time period, he's kind of like you have people who are like pursuing a music career or you're having people who are going into the corporate world and climbing the ladder. But he's like kind of doing a couple of different things at once where he just kind of he kind of falls into a, a, a corporate career track at in, in, a, in a television studio. But he's also making music and he just happens to get a song that actually becomes a legitimate pop hit. It's not like, oh, little known fact, the this guy or this person who who did this thing that was successful or famous for this in their early career, they tried their hand at music and had this little song they made. Like, no, he this song, I like you hear this song on the radio now on an oldie station. Um, I've heard this song a million times. And so in this early stage of his career, he wrote this song and they started playing it in on local stations and then it blew up and became and it it charted on Billboard's Hot 100. And then they were like, they called him and they were like, they were like, Chucky Butterfinger BB. We need another hit from the Chucky BB. And he was like, eh, eh, I kind of I'm kind of doing this other thing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go like make TV shows. I'm going to go like produce TV shows. Uh, eh, eh. And just <laughs> just to think of that, like this guy was just like he was just sitting there and he was just like, which um, mega successful career track do I need to reject? Like, yeah, 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 yeah. Like he was like, hmm, all right, I woke up today and I can either be one of the most famous and influential musicians of all time or one of the, the key creative figures behind an entire cultural movement that will define the next quarter century. Uh, gong show. I'm going to go with the gong show. But can, just can you can you imagine that, though? Like, the, that's the it's almost crazier than the George Lazenby thing, because I mean, yeah, he was a successful model and then he like. But then like the whole his whole story was like, I'm going to like risk. I'm going to go and do this crazy stunt to like kind of strong arm my way into this into this situation. I'm going to like walk into the office and bar, you know, run past the receptionist and storm into the room and have my one shot to like do this killer audition and then like be given this opportunity based on my my sort of brazen attitude and my you know, my, my de- devil may care attitude, but that, that wasn't even what this was. This was just like, he just had like these three different things happening at once and they were all just working well for him. And then he just got to a point point where he was just like, I need to choose between three mega successful careers now. Like that was his problem was like, which one do I choose? Which is, which is insane. Like <laughs> that's so, that's so unrelatable to most people to like the idea of just like, that you would be put into this position of having to choose between like what dream job do you want? Not like, yeah, what, what, and like in a, some ways, a, in some what, ways it's even scarier too. Cause it's, it's, it's not what dream job do you want? It's what dreams are you going to kill? You yeah. know, like if you show, if you were presented that kind of fork in the road and then chose incorrectly, or even if you didn't choose incorrectly, like I, I don't think it would take a supreme egomaniac to get, you know, to be 50, 60, 70 years old and look back and not wonder what if, regardless of how successful it was, you know, yeah. like you literally could have had Chuck Barris's multi million dollar career helming five of the most successful TV shows of all time and still probably looked back and been like, I don't know, man. And I, and I think as we as we get into this, I think that kind of. Oh, yeah. Let, let me let's not spoil it. But I think that's kind of where we're going with this. Yes, completely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so he's eventually promoted to the, the head of programming at for daytime on ABC. And uh, game shows were really big at that point in time. And Chuck Barris was becoming frustrated with how terrible the pitches for game shows were that he was getting. So he basically kind of doubled down. Right. He he he. <laughs> in a kind of supreme level ego maneuver, he just took it into his own hands and he quit ABC and started pitching his own game show ideas to the various networks, which is like a whole other level of just self-confidence where you're just like, I've, I've got 
the two of the three careers that everyone wants fuck this i'm gonna start again from scratch because i i've seen what the competition is and these guys are bitches yeah yeah it's it's like not everything we just discussed not only did he sort of have these two potential career paths of like i could either become a legit um pop star or i could become this mega successful television producer and then he chose television producer and then like shortly into his career as a television producer he was just like this kind of sucks like i would rather just i would rather be pitching the shows because these guys are terrible and so he just he quit the job that he chose and then just like started his own business so he formed chuck barris productions on june 14th 1965 and believe it or not he sold his first show that year and the name of the show was the dating game yeah how like how did how does that like i, I don't i don't even want i don't want to come off like i'm just like fawning over this guy in this like worship way like he's so cool it, it's more just fascinating to me um but on top of every like what are the what are the odds of this on top like you hear i don't know what the level of truth or verisimilitude of this is because these are just these are idioms that we come up with to salve uh neuroses or or existential qualms or psychological issues that we have with our lives within the context of the human condition but you you hear these things all the time of like you know you you have to fail a thousand times before you get your success or like everybody is going to fail like and especially in like the business world that's like the mantra of like the the, the Gary V thing of like if you're not failing you're not succeeding hey, look, man, look, man, look, man, i'm out of here and i've got my nfts right <laughs> and my nfts my nfts are like they're like a billion dollar nfts right but but look at me man like i came from nothing okay and i i just went and i like learned about nfts like yesterday okay and like this is what you want to do okay this is what you want to do you want to identify an area where there's growth in the marketplace okay okay and you just want to look at that and you want to say how can i outgrow these people who are growing okay okay do you know what I'm saying, man? Do you know what I'm saying? That's that's really weird because your your Gary V impression sounds like sounds like qualm. <laughs> yeah, it really does. It really does. You you do a really good qualm impression. That's weird. But you hear that all the time. Um and like I said, whether however true that actually is, that just feels like it's the thing. That that's like the the human the triumph of the will that has been that's a poor choice of words but i was just gonna say why are you saying why are you phrasing it that way that's a triumph of the will and my struggle are they're obviously associated with very bad things but they're just also phrases they're also expressions yeah but at this point you could say a triumph of will and it would mean something different than the triumph of the will like yeah Yeah, so so you know that's the that's the thing that's kind of been beaten into us is like that's how it works but chuck barris he was able to choose between like two or three different dream jobs. And then he started one of them and then saw an area where he could like disrupt what he was doing from the other side. And he did it and it was like hugely successful. But not only that, not only that, but also in another version of this story, he does that. And then the first, but then like the first time they pitched a show, it didn't go as well as he thought it would. would. And so they went back and tried again. And then in the early years, they produced a sh- they produced game shows such as Flobbity Squawk and Oh My God, My Underwear Are Bugs. And you haven't heard of those ones. But then five years later came. But in this story, the first one he did is arguably the most recognizable game show outside of like Jeopardy! Family Feud and Wheel of Fortune of all time. Yeah, it's it's almost like he just skipped over THX 1138, American Graffiti, and the whole American Zoetrope thing. And it's just like I wake up one morning and created Star Wars. Yep. Yeah. He. Yeah. He just. He literally like the to follow that metaphor. This Chuck Barris's life is as if George Lucas was in was it was at Cal Arts and they were like oh hey George um so uh you invented a new type of cereal that has 
um, little marshmallows in it, and it's themed after a fanciful leprechaun that's always trying to get the cereal. Um, and, and they're called Lukey Charms. And so, do you want to that people love Lukey Charms? Do you want to come and like be like the uh, like a huge cereal ma- magnate and like be just the biggest cereal producer ever? And he's just like, um, I think I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna just make star a Star Wars. And they're like, okay, fine. And then he's like, all right. Uh, anyway, I'm making a Star Wars. And then he just made a Star Wars. And then that was it. End of story. Yeah. yeah. End of story. The dating game was hosted by Jim Lang and was comprised of three would-be lovers attempting to go on a date with a member of the opposite sex who was blocked from view. That's right. You would attempt to woo a potential companion without the help of your physical form. That's from the time- that's a that's a re- that's a really metaphysical postmodern way of describing <laughs> dating game. <laughs> I'm out here, man. I'm out here. Degraduated and uh, <laughs> and and physical forms. You don't got them. For the time, the show was very risque. Sexual innuendos were commonplace and. The show had this whole flower power theme to the sets, which at that point in time is actually considered like avant-garde and crazy. Like, wow, there's paintings of flowers on the wall. Whoa. Also, I noticed watching a bunch of old game show footage, which is something that I never intellectualized or it or uh, noticed in these old games, which I've watched. I've watched it all, all these, you know, uh, I, I feel like the time slot on Fox in the 90s and early 2000s was at 10 p.m. or maybe 9 p.m. is when The Simpsons came on. And then after The Simpsons, it was a block of random game shows. And it, and it was anything from like modern game shows. There, there was like that show Street Smarts and Blind Date. But then also they would play old game shows. So I've seen a ton of these. But I noticed that these these shows in the 60s, there must have been some kind of trend of this. Because every single one of them, when the show starts, the contestants all are like, they all like glide in on giant rolling platforms. Hell like, yes. Every show is like that. They, 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 there's like people and they're all sitting on some big like parade float. And then it just comes in and glides into place. Hell yes. When I die, I want you to wheel my body in on a giant parade float like that. Just. Wouldn't that feel, wouldn't that actually make you, like, would that make you seem even smaller? Like, if just your, <laughs> your. <laughs> the way you phrase that of even smaller, like, it's physically impossible to be smaller than me, but the optical illusion of me on a float would be even, even smaller. <laughs> yeah, you, you'd, you'd look like Lily Tomlin at the end of The Incredible Shrinking Woman, right before she I mean, winked out of existence. That sounds great to me. That sounds awesome. Don't don't fucking shit up my dreams. <laughs> so basically, the the show is this kind of like "Hello, my fellow youth" is a type of energy where it's you know obviously guys who are not part of the hippie movement and not part of youth culture at the time co opting the visuals of youth the '60s youth movement in order to try and monetize it. And um, there is no ethical consumption under capitalism, so it worked. And the show was an instant smash success. I love the. It's so funny to me that the the just the just the the aesthetic and the format of the dating game, which is once again not necessarily something I ever internalized about it, but it it's just like and it, and it's I, at this point it's been parodied. You see you see parodies of this type of thing, but it's literally like just going back to the idea of like oh it was it was it was provocative for the time or whatever. Like yes, it was provocative for the time, but also. Every show was just like contestant number two. What would you do if we went back to my house and turned down the lights? And then the guy is just like, "Well, if we did that, then I would lick your butthole." Like it, it's just like <laughs> that. That's just what the show is. It's like I'll say a seemingly innocent question, and then you say some like some innuendo that you clearly didn't come up with yourself. That yeah. s- that some writer told you to say. Yeah, it's it's just as scripted as uh, Paul Lynn's comebacks on Hollywood Squares. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the show is this huge success. It becomes a juggernaut and it runs for 
like multiple decades. It basically runs continuously until 1980. And then after that, it's been revived three separate times um, for additional like reboots. However, in 1966, Barris took over what most people consider to be his crowning achievement, the newlywed game. Originally created by Nick Nicholson and E. Roger Muir, the show pitted two newly wedded couples against each other and asked them questions about each other. The interpersonal friction and host Bob Eubanks' sly remarks made the show another almost instant smash success. The show was ABC's longest running, longest lasting program until um, it basically it holds the record for the longest running program on ABC, lasting a full 19 years in its initial run. Um, and then the Game Show Network has a current version of it airing right now with Sherry Shepard as the host, which is just crazy that there's a new newlywed game show. That's just wild. It's also um, it's also just, you know, worth stopping and acknowledging. And to a certain degree, this is obvious because this is just kind of how, how everything is. But that it at this at this time, you know, you could you could say that he was like this massively innovative, creative force. And I think that's to a certain degree true within this genre. But also an aspect of that is just like there just wasn't that much stuff. So it was like there was a lot of room to just like pluck ideas out of the ether. But now like it's kind of it's kind of astonishing because it's not just the fact that these shows still exist or have been rebooted multiple times or whatever. It's also just like kind of like every show is just some like remix of these shows. And it's and it's kind of mind blowing. Like like I can't even imagine being a person who's just like looks around and it's just like, yeah, like I had I crapped out a like these like 10 ideas back in the 70s. And now like all TV is just like iterations of it. Mm -hmm. it it's 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 kind of mind blowing. Yeah. Um. So when when Chuck Barris uh, was asked about the newlywed game in 2009, when he was on an appearance, uh, he was he was on the, the PBS or not PBS uh, NPR game show. Wait, wait, don't tell me. He was asked about the show and how it came together. So basically, in in two thousand nine, he was on he was on the newlywed game, and or he was on wait wait don't tell me. And they asked him about the newlywed game, and he basically just said it was like the easiest job he'd ever had. All I needed was four couples, eight questions, and a washer dryer. Which is a really funny way of being like. And then I just fell backwards into money. Yeah, which is the which is what I was just saying is like these. I, I, not to diminish like the any amount of any level of the skill or hard work that he put into it but it's just like there just weren't that many things and so he's just this guy going around you know finding opportunities he gets in a room and he's like uh yeah so uh some people are dating yeah, and then, right? and then like, and that's, that's it. it that's it yeah that's it yeah <laughs> and then now and and then now it's like you've you've like defined daytime television forever yeah and ev yeah. everything is just some postmodern reinterpretation of that format. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's it's interesting, though, when you kind of look at somebody's batting average, because, you know, when we were talking about like he just rolled up and created the dating game, like it's not totally true. It's not completely off, though, but it's also not completely true. Basically, after the newlywed game, he goes into kind of a dark period where he struggles to sell some shows for a period. And then comes out this side, the other side and he's very successful again. But I just wanted to go through this kind of like list of the projects that he sold and the projects that he was working on um, and, and, you know, had success with like each one of these things, even when it's, you know, not a uh, massive, massive thing. It's still a project that made it far enough that it got pilots produced or something like that, which is like some people have a pilot produced but doesn't go to series. And that's like. Uh, uh, enough money for them to live for their entire life you know like, yeah very rarely but you know that's a supreme level of success in that so the yeah, first the, show that before the uh the before the creator of bojack horseman became the creator of bojack horseman he his job was literally just he would get hired by studios to like take like treatments for movies that they didn't they they, they, they movies where it was like oh there might be some potential here but like we're not super excited about these like, see if you can turn this into something. And then he would write the screenplay base. And basically his job was to like, they weren't looking for him to figure it out. They were looking for him to basically help them to 
cross it off the list and be like, nope, that's a dead end. So he would just like write these scripts with the intention of like being like, see, this sucks. Scrap it. And so he would like for years, he would just write these scripts that were they he, there wasn't even an intention of getting them produced. It was just like, I'm proving to you that this isn't a good I, a good investment. And may, he made tons of money off of doing that. So I just kind of wanted to go through this list of titles with you really quick and kind of go through the the shows that he had on the air and a talk about the titles b talk about if we've ever seen the show and see what the kind of just, just you'll you'll see it's this will be fun just based off the titles so the first andrew what is the first show that chuck barris sold the dollar 98 beauty show <laughs> which as the name would imply is it was a like beauty contest show where they had a dollar 98 cents which I've never seen, but it was the '60s, so it was in in today's money. It was the three billion dollar beauty show. Like this was this <laughs> right, was high right. end. Yeah, 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 yeah. Of course. Uh, so what was the what was the second show he sold? Bamboozle, which was a pilot that didn't go to series. Uh, and I choose to believe that this is the show they were that they were trying to make a narrative show out of Spike Lee's Bamboozled. Um, end of joke. They just, so, made, they just made a, a game show. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, they were just like, we, <laughs> our, our producers got hold of a time machine and went to the future, but then they were quickly chased out of the time by the future police. And the only thing they were able to do before they were sent back to the 60s was watch the first movie that they found, which was this movie called Bamboozled. And now you have to guess the plot to this movie from the future. Yeah. Um, the next show is called Camouflage. No idea what that show is. And then the show after that was the Chuck Barris Rah Rah Show, which I love. <laughs> these sound I, these sound fake. Yeah, yeah. These but sound the Chuck- like these sound like these sound like the names of game shows on a a TV station in robocop yes absolutely they, they sound like shows that are like the fake movie titles in seinfeld um so the next show is called comedy courtroom which was i guess a comedic like judge judy show and it that one only got to pilot it didn't get to series he also had another one called cop out which also didn't go to series but was a unsold pilot that was and just then, that was just his script for that one kevin smith movie with, with yeah. bruce willis yeah 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 he, he wrote that and then it sat it sat on the shelf for years, and then Kevin Smith was like, "I'll make this piece of shit." And then, and then the next the next thing he does is the dating dating game, and that like just you know lights the world on fire and kind of jumpstarts his career in a real way. Then he sold another pilot called The Dollar a Second Show, and then Dream Girl of 1967. That one was actually a huge hit, but then it they did it at the end of the year, and then it became 1968, and then they were just like, "Ah, oh, fuck." <laughs> Yeah, we, they couldn't they couldn't reboot the show. They lost the, the the original illustrator files for the logo. So they were just like, eh, fuck it. He's got to cancel the show. What's the, the, what's the, the what's Mama the Cast television show? Did, yep. did, did Hillsmer name that that show? Yeah, and it, was, it was a special on ABC that aired in 1969. Um, and then the next two shows that he did were kind of takeoffs of the dating game where they were called The Family Game and the game game and they were both you know interview game show contestant quiz things where you're asking people questions about each other this really just reinforces what i was saying before like every single one of these like like you know like we we have been we have sat in rooms to pitch ideas for things i mean you've you've done it i've done it we've done it together and when we've gone and pitched things like we have some ideas but then whenever you're like in the room talking to the people like if you if you're like getting an energy that they aren't into some of the ideas that you are pitching to them, or maybe if you feel like you're just, or maybe those like you run out of of pitches and then you just have more time, or whatever the scenario is, you just start like making up shit. And sometimes those can be good ideas. Sometimes you just have like this good idea when you're just like fucking improving because you're like freaking out and you don't know what to say, and then you actually come up with a good idea. But it, most of the time, you're just like saying weird, random shit because you're literally just like improving in this like high pressure situation. And every single one of these sounds like he was in a pitch meeting where he had no ideas. And then he just he just like 
was like uh looking around the room and you just saw like a dollar on the table and he's like the uh dollar 98 beauty show yeah 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 uh and he looked he looked up on the wall and there was like a army recruitment poster and he's like camouflage well this is then the, the next two on the list are exactly that the next show he sold which made it on the air was how's your mother-in-law <laughs> These, these. And, then, and then the next show, which is, I can't even believe that this is the title of a TV show, was just Leave It to the Women. Leave It to the Women? What? What is that show? Like, I have that, no idea. I've never that, seen it. That show, like, I mean, I it was the 1960s, so I doubt it was, I, I, I'm pretty sure I know which one it was. But that, based on that title, that could either be some weird misogynistic thing where it's a game show where you're just like oh bro the- bro bro do we want to watch a little bit of leave it to the women because there's full episodes on youtube right now i mean sure because like leave it to the women yeah but that could that could either be like oh like the women are always messing stuff up or it could be like leave it to the women like they yes. they know how to take care of business <laughs> yeah right yeah 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 i doubt it's that one though no it, there's no way it is Welcome to Leave It to the Women. Today's panelists are actress playwright Sandy Sprung, actress Sally Inette Marshall, entertainer Abby Lane, and myself, Bess Armstrong. And here's our host, Stephanie Edwards. Hello again, everybody. We discuss something extremely serious today, so take that demeanor. We're going to ask, do I need a facelift if I'm beginning to trip on my neck? <laughs> if there is a fountain of youth, this is a fake show. What the fuck? This is a fake show from a movie. What? Is this the right Leave It to the Women? Are there think... multiple Leave It to the Women's? I mean, it's from the 70s. No, it's from 81. Oh yeah, 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 81. I thought I thought it said 70s in the in the when I clicked on it. I speak of Phyllis Diller herself. Before we applaud and go nuts. Uh, we speak of Phyllis, who says, by the way, she was the cover girl for three successive issues of Fish and Wildlife. I would like to ask the, the friends here joining me if they have had experience with any types of... Uh, what is this show? What it's like a, is it's, this? It's like a is hybrid... Is this The View? Yeah, it's like, it's like a talk show. It's, like, it's not like a game show. Wow. All right. Well, <laughs> wow. That was that's a bit of a departure. That is not what I was expecting that to be. Chuck Barris was just like, "All right, guys, let's stop messing around. I want to do a hard hitting, female driven talk show where a where a where a panel of playwrights, playwright girl bosses, talk about current affairs." I'm afraid I may have girl bossed too close to the Chuck Barris. <laughs> it kind of was the thing. I the other thing that I said it could have been. Yeah, it was. I'm kind of surprised. So after after Leave It to the Women, then he does the Newlywed Game, which reads a whole new era of success into his career. And then the Parent Game, People's Pickers, Three's a Crowd, and then Treasure Hunt slash The New Treasure Hunt. And then, because that wasn't enough, he started getting into variety shows and did Operation Entertainment, The Bobby Vinton Show, and Your Hit Parade, which is basically like the UK show Top of the Pops. It was like a ripoff of Top of the Pops. And after all of that, he finally gets to the peak of Chuck Barris's fame and his the, the apex of his cultural relevancy, The Gong Show. Ugh. Ugh, all right. Here you go. Jesus Christ, finally. I can put these things down. Are you happy now? Oh, man, those those paint cans don't seem that heavy, Hillsmer. They seem like normal paint cans to me. It's not about whether they're heavy or not. It's the weight of doing you a favor. Acquaintance unit, Hillsmer. Next time you need someone to lift something, please ask me. I have arms three times the size of your body. What the hell, Hillsmer? What? What? Where did you get these cans? These look like super old. This is 1965 on it. I don't think that's paint encrusted on the rim of that paint can. Where did you get these? Oh, uh, you, you know, I have a guy. You have, you have a paint guy? I have a guy. 
Let's just keep it at that. These paint cans are from like the 60s. Like they probably have lead in them. Like this is not good. Friend unit, Andrew, give me the paint can. I will open it up for you. All right, you can try, but this thing is really welded on here pretty tight. I mean, I, I'm i not gonna, I don't wanna brag, but like, I got, I got some muscles. I feel like if I couldn't do it, I'm not sure you're gonna be able to do it. Oh, oh, oh. This can is made of some very strong material. I told you, they made, back in the 70s, they made stuff way stronger and way more cancer causing. Yeah, whatever. Fuck you guys. Give me the give me the fucking can of paint. Give me the can of paint. Dave. Fuck you. Fuck you. I'm going to be able to open this. Fuck you. Get away from me. Get away from me. Dave. Listen to him. He can do this. He can do this. Okay, fine. Let's go through the motions of this. All right, here we go. Here we go. Fuck you all. Fuck you all. I've got this. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. I'm opening this fucking can of paint. <laughs> Oh, uh, okay. Open! Open sesame! Open sesame! Open sesame! Open sesame! Open sesame! My god, this is the most pathetic thing I've ever seen in my life. Will you fucking open it then. Jesus! Alright, fine. I'll open the can because I'm clearly I'm the strongest one out of all of us. I have that space hell strength. Give me it. Inked. I inked. This is humiliating. This is disgusting, even for me. I hate this. I hate every part of this. God, I wish there was just somebody else. We're never gonna get this fucking room painted if we don't get this can of paint open. We're gonna use this room for a billiards room. Billiards room? I thought we were making this a VR paradise. A little bit of column A, a little bit of column B, baby. VR, VR billiards. billiards. <laughs> uh, hey guys? You in here? Ah, oh, Spandrew, dude, please, can you help us get this this fucking can of paint open? You think he's going to be able to open the paint cans if I couldn't open them? Just give him the fucking paint cans, friend unit, Andrew. Okay, fine, fine, here. If anyone can do it, it is our new friend, Spandrew Spice. All right, uh, well, let me, here goes. Huh, there you go. I, th I think you guys, uh, I think you guys loosened it up for me. Act two. When you're successful, the only thing that keeps you up at night is not being successful. In 1976, Chuck created the show that would define his career and made himself the host. He was our first nonconformist hippie slash, you know, tripping host. But it was a move he would ultimately regret. What he did wasn't obvious and he didn't get credit. And then because it was a type of show that wasn't popular with the critics, he got a lot of criticism. Don't just stand there, do something. In the beginning, uh, I just sloughed those critics off, but they got to me. I mean, over the years, over 15 or 20 years, they got to me. It was very hurtful. He tried not to let it bother him, but it did bother him, and it was very, very hurtful. I think part of the time he realized he had gone too far and he was out of control, but, you know, he had gone too far and he was out of control. There are times when the show seems to have been a wonderful thing to have done, but um, I wouldn't want to go back and do it again. By the mid-1970s, Barris needed a new creative challenge. Or at least that's how he put it to himself. He needed a new mountain to climb, and as such, he crowned himself the host of The Gong Show. The Gong Show was originally intended to be a spoof of other talent shows that were all the rage at the time. However, this 
sardonic edge to the program was quickly lost in the shuffle. Ostensibly, the show featured amateur comedians and musicians and performers who would come out on stage and, if they were good enough, got to perform their whole routine. And if they weren't, they got the gong and were ushered off the stage in a comedic fashion. The show and, the re- ran- and the reason why he originally became the host is because there was original there was an original host of the one of the versions of the shows and he 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 didn't he felt bad like making fun of the contestants and he kept trying to like find the good in what they were doing and look for the and look for like actual talent as opposed to what the show was supposed to be which was like celebrating how terrible everybody was and he became he was uh chuck barris was like really frustrated with him that he wasn't doing it right and somebody was just like why don't you just be the fucking host and then he was like okay yeah sounds good the show ran for only two seasons from 1976 to 1978 and then was syndicated from 76 through 80 however it developed a cult following and received widespread criticism from critics at the time who felt the show was lowbrow in poor taste or quite frankly just bad Barris's jokey, bumbling personality, his accentuated hand clapping in between sentences, which eventually had the studio audiences joining in with him, and his catchphrases, he would usually go on commercial breaks with, we'll be right back with more, uh, stuff, occasionally paired with shifting his head to reveal the ubiquitous sign between the stage that simply just read stuff, and this is me saying bye, was one of his favorite closing lines. Um, it, it, it was kind of the antithesis of a lot of the uh, game show hosts and variety show hosts at that time who were really kind of more hosts in a classical sense, right? They were kind of, like you're saying, they're polished, they're well-spoken, they're dramatically trained actors or performers of some kind, and they're good at kind of like making sure that things don't go out of control or that the train stays on the tracks. And Chuck Barris is almost by design the exact opposite of that, where like he purposefully would fuck with people he would try and make accidents happen and try and make the show be a failure every time as a means of kind of like, I think in a good faith argument, it's like it's a deconstruction of the performative act of tele- televising narrative. In reality, uh, I think it's probably just because he had bad faith and realized that they got a visceral emotional reaction from people when the show seemed to be not going well. So then he just tried to make it not go well all the time. And that made the whole show feel the same always. Yeah. And it's not just that like other game shows were more buttoned up. And then this one was like goofy. It was like openly postmodern to the point where, like I said before, if you watch clips from the gong show, you're just like, oh, this is like a thing that would be on a TV in RoboCop. Like the like the, the it it's it's that over the top to the point where you watch it and you're just like, I can't believe this was real like this. Like you 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 think of you associate these kinds of like postmodern deconstructions of things with a more contemporary time like this is kind of what we do now and to look back at the in the 70s and see something like this it just it it boggles the mind cuz it's like who 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 is letting this be on the air and i'm not saying that in a bad way like this thing sucked why are they letting this air but i just can't believe that this was allowed to go on at that time which is a perfect transition into the next thing I wanted to talk about. I, one of the reasons why the show went off the air is because it consistently had all of these like controversies surrounding it. And the two that were kind of the nails in the, the coffin for the show is there was one instance where there was a performer on the show named Jean Jean the Dancing Machine. And in that segment, Jane P. Morgan opened her blouse and exposed her breasts on national TV. And then another one was that they had two teenage in the, girls. In the immortal words of Bill Ingvall, well, there's your problem. <laughs> and then the other the other segment that really pushed the show over the edge was they did a scene where two teenage girls were suggestively sucking on lollipops. Popsicles. Uh, So this is the Jean Jean, the dancing machine one, which which d- before we watch the actual thing, just to give a little bit of backstory in that Jean Jean, d- the dancing machine is a guy who he would just call out and he would just come onto the stage and dance. And it was just it was just complete chaos. But this guy was just a janitor at the studio who Chuck Barris s- saw him dancing 
and he was just like you should come out on the stage and do that and then he just became like a weird like you know the king of cartoons where he would just he would call him out and he was like a he was a part of the show who he would wheel out and he would do his little segment and then he would leave and he was just he was a he was a janitor at, at the television studio the people are just like throwing trash and toys yeah. and things at gene gene the dancing machine as he's dancing and he's trying to dance and the crowd is eating this up for some reason they're loving it they're loving it yeah, this is this is just pure chaos yeah, it's not a TV show. It's just people screaming in front of a camera. And we keep cutting back and forth in between a panel of uh, panelists, Chuck Barris and Jean Jean the Dancing Machine doing really bad dancing. Oh, and here we go. And one of the panelists is taking their shirt off and oh. she flashes the audience. Oh, shit. It actually showed up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one of the other panelists who has a giant afro is just standing there in complete bewilderment. Yeah, he's uh, he had a look on his face like, this is all ending. This is the end of this show. And maybe my career somehow by association. And now we're seeing the end credits roll. So that, that got them in a lot of hot water. I mean, that, that's it. We don't have to yeah, I was, I was thinking. Roll. I was thinking that like she turned away from the camera and like opened up her shirt in that way that people do on shows mm-hmm. where it's like implied. Mm-hmm. But it was full, full on. Oh, man the nips yeah i mean yeah of course obviously there's no actual problem with that but you know by the by the standards of this time yeah it's it's shocking free free them nips baby now we're going to the next scene which is the infamous gong show popsicle twins uh segment all right ladies and gentlemen one of the girls in this next act says her hobbies are boys and first aid i guess that means that on weekends she cruises Hollywood Boulevard in an ambulance. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Mark. Here she is. Oh, I love this act. Oh, now this has some substance. It's about time we had substance on this show of fame. Here comes Have You Got a Nickel? Yeah. Uh, wheel back the curtain. Two barefoot teenage girls run out, sit down on the uh, stage, and now they're just filleting popsicles yeah they're it's this is not even subtle this is so trashy yeah it's not subtle at all it's like yeah it's like it's like something that would happen on the man show but like the man show was from the late 90s where this was where you know the culture had shifted a lot to this they're just doing it you know they're just sitting there yeah yeah that was that they did it that was that was that yeah So the show goes off the air in 1978 and uh, it kind of has a little minor resurgence in syndication for a while um, where it still culturally is looked down on a lot and quite frankly, understandably. uh, It is, while I enjoy something around the irony of that this feels like something from another dimension, uh, Chuck Barris is kind of unbearable to watch. uh, And I, yeah, this is not, this is not my speed. This is not my speed. Yeah, um, it's, I, I, I find the aesthetic of it interesting and kind of pleasing just within the microcosm of imagining it as like some bizarre show on a TV screen in like a dystopian sci-fi movie. But I can't imagine actually watching that show and like let alone multiple episodes of it every week, but just watching one episode and just be like, yes, this is what I'm watching right now. I am entertained by random chaos because it's like it's like. It's like this postmodern, this postmodern interpretation of game shows, but without like the absurdism that would actually make it entertaining. Like it's, yeah. it, it is, it is not the Eric Andre show. Yeah, it is just like I can't even, I can't even really describe it. It's like it's like the it's it's a mixture of the worst parts of American Idol and the worst parts of the Man Show. Yeah. Um. But so basically, you know, it has this still. It's it. It's not as smash hit as some of his other projects, but it's it's very successful. And so because of that, in 1980, he gets given money to go make uh, the Gong Show feature film called The Gong Show The Movie, which is how does this this guy has not nine lives, but 900 lives. Yeah, they're just like, they're just like yeah, do uh, you want to make a movie of this bizarre train wreck that you do every week that like for some reason we keep letting you do, even though it's like objectively not a show? Yeah. But so do you want to you want to make a movie of that, though? Yeah. So, you know, that thing that's not a show. 
How about turning that into a feature narrative film where we follow you around as the principal character for an entire week and we see what your week is like. And then we follow contestants and competitors and we see like stressful situations and you know, we, we follow characters as they have like nervous breakdowns. How about that? Does that sound cool? Cool. Here's $25 million. <laughs> Andrew is doing the you think I'm going to say no pose. And yes. Do you think I'm going to say no? Yes. Completely. Um, so let's let's watch the trailer for the uh, the gong show, the movie. There's a scene where a guy blows out a candle by... And that you and your girlfriend... And that two young girls actually... No wonder you're exhausted. Hmm? You couldn't show it on TV? So you had to make it into a movie? Oh, goody! The Gong Show movie starts Friday at a theater near you. From Universal Pictures, rated... Like, I, I can't stress enough that these things seem like things that would be made now as these, like, weird, absurdist, postmodern parodies. Yeah, but they are not postmodern. They're just schlock. Chuck Barris's name is above the title. His name is above the title. It's Chuck <laughs> Barris, the Gong Show movie. <laughs> and then let's let's watch this other... I think the other one's an actual, like... I don't know if it's a clip or what is what is this? Oh yeah, this is a little bit more involved trailer. Yeah. What pushed this man over the edge? His new movie, the Gong Show movie. Oh, come get me. It's just, it's just showing random clips from the show. This is like, this is like Ed Hardy, Monty Python. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it really is. It's, it's like Jackass crossed with uh, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. Yeah, it's just like, it's just like you, 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 watching this. It's like, and it's like seeing the clips from the Gong Show and then watching this. You're just like, you almost wanna like be like oh like it's it's kind of interesting what they're doing that it's like it's like you there's a it seems like there's some kind of seed of trying to do this provocative absurdist thing but it's just like the most generic not generic but they're just the most like white bread like i don't actually understand how to do absurdist comedy version of it and it's and it's funny because they were one of the related videos on this youtube video is is a a, an Andy Kaufman segment and you know just Andy Kaufman this is not yeah, no shit right so if you had to guess if this movie would be successful would you guess yay or nay <laughs> definitely definitely nay well you'd be right because this movie opened the same weekend as Empire Strikes Back and The Shining oh so it was the, it was the biggest movie of, of of the year yes yeah it it failed mega hard after so seeing so it, we learn we in the end we learn sure maybe George Lucas had to go through the THX phase and he didn't have the choice between Lukey Charms and Star Wars but in the long run he won. <laughs> After seeing Gong Show the movie, legendary comedian George Burns said, "For the f- <laughs> for the first time in sixty five years." That's not what George Burns I know sounds it's like. Not. I know it's not. That's 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 the that's the what started to come out of my mouth as I tried to do it for the first time. Okay, that's pretty good. For the first time in sixty five years, I wanted to get out of show business. <laughs> I love it. I love it so much. Um, despite near universal revile from fans and critics alike. This wouldn't be the end of Chuck Barris's career. He was going to become a literal spy. Maybe, if you believe him. Popsicle twins. <laughs> Oh, well, I think we did it. Looks pretty good. Yeah, I, I got to admit, I you are like a master painter, Spandrew. I didn't know that painting a wall could be an art form, but 
this is this is your Sistine Chapel, honestly. I'm kind of surprised that you're so skilled at painting, you know, because you've only got one eye. Like, I would have thought the depth perception thing would have, like, messed you up or something. But I was obviously being ableist, and I apologize for that. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean it was really fun painting with you guys. Had a blast. And uh, I got to get going because I got to I'm going down to the Boys and Girls Club to volunteer. Here's Spandrew Spice. Before you leave, may I ask you a question? Shoot, Zero, my man. Will you take me away from this place? Well, see you guys later. Act three, the largest grain of salt humanly possible to eat, like a rock of salt, really. In 1984, Barris wrote his autobiography, Confessions of a Dangerous Mind. In his book, Barris claims that he applied for a job at the CIA when he was first working as a page back in the day at NBC. After he rose to the ranks of the television industry, he was approached by a governmental operative and asked to perform tasks for queen and country, as it were. In the opening line of the book, he claimed that he's killed 33 people. At the time, I, I, I checked into the, uh, to the Wyndham Hotel, which is uh, on 60-something uh, Street. Yes, in New York. And it's, it, it's just behind uh, Rumpelmeyer's or the Park Sheraton. And, uh, and uh, I, in, in that hotel, I decided to stay for uh, two weeks and write uh, confessions of a dangerous mind, but I stayed for uh, two years and 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 uh, eventually moved everything into that apartment, the the hotel room, and 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 the book, you know, uh, St. Martin's Press uh, published the book first, and Tom McCormick, who was president of St. Martin's, loved the book. He said, and he printed a hundred thousand copies. And uh, that was a huge printing in those days. And uh, it, it sold about 7,800. So I had tons of books as, as a <laughs> remainder. And, uh, and it, uh, eventually, you know, it became, it became a movie. In the film, they, they talk about some of the stuff you write about. And I know you've been asked over the years countless times about whether the stuff you wrote in that book are true, particularly the part about your work as a secret CIA assassin. What do you say when people ask you about it? Well, I, I don't answer that question uh, ever. And, uh, and um, I can just tell you that the number two guy in the CIA said uh, in answer to, to uh, reporters asking that question that, that I must have been standing too close to, to the gong. <laughs> Uh, when I say things like that, but uh, still, I'll, I'll, no, I'll never say one way or the other. Well, it's 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 an interesting question. I mean, I mean, being an assassin for for the United States is is uh, not near general public. You said you don't answer that question. Have you ever? You don't have to answer it for me, but have you ever told anybody about it? No. Including never, never, Della including my or wife. your wife. He just tries to catch him in like a bully's logic trap. He's just like, have you ever told any of your victims that you've murdered that you're a CIA agent? And he's like, he's like, no. And he's like, oh, so you do have victims that you've killed as a CIA agent? Gotcha. Yeah. So the book, it's pretty wild, though, that like the book comes out in 1984 is this huge, colossal failure and then cut to 2002 and they made a feature film adaptation of it, directed and co-starring George Clooney, written by Charlie fucking Kaufman. That doesn't seem real. None of the things in this guy's life seems real. Chuck Barris, he, he is from a pocket dimension that is a world spawned by a throwaway made up movie title in an episode of Seinfeld. Yeah, it's it's like, like they they made up a fake movie in an episode of Seinfeld. It created a pocket dimension where in which the universe within that fake movie became real and he yeah. lives in that universe. Yeah, and the the only way to access that universe is by saying death blow when you have a death blow against you, not because of the things you've done, but because of all other reasons altogether, which is a direct quote from Seinfeld. Uh 
because I just rewatched the whole thing. Or Chunnel. Maybe there's a Chunnel. You have to make a Chunnel reference. I think uh, I think you have to I think you have to bang a gong. That makes the most sense. You bang a gong and then you say prognosis negative. Come on, man. That's three for three fake movies from Seinfeld. <laughs> I am fucking killing it right now. Listen back through the show and in clusters of episodes, try to parse out like why is Dave like exclusively making references to this one specific thing? Like he's not just making random references to different things. He's just only referencing this one thing. And you can actually track what TV shows he was watching at every in every episode <laughs> at, at that time. It's very true. It's very true. Yeah. Um, so Charlie Kaufman is one of my favorite writers. I, I like his movies a lot. I've, I've read his novel, Ant Kind. I really enjoyed it. It's very surreal, as you might expect. Um, but uh, this movie, I had completely forgotten that he wrote this movie. And I, I don't know that I would have remembered that from seeing the trailer. When was it? Have you seen this movie? Yeah, I saw it a long time ago, but I barely remember anything about it, really. It was it was more of a like when I in being reminded of it for this, it was more of a like, oh, yeah, that like that was kind of more my reaction. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was pretty much my reaction too. Um, let's watch. Let's watch the trailer for this and see how much. Oh, yeah, that. My name is Charles Hirsch Barris. I've written pop songs. I've been a television producer. In addition, I have murdered 33 human beings. I talked to a psychic today. Drew Barrymore and Sam Rockwell. Fucking Rudger Hauer in this shit. And Julia Roberts. That's it. That's the show. His future was uncertain. I'm sorry about your show. Are you okay? I just want to entertain people. His every move was being watched. I could use your help. I work for the Office of Diplomatic Security. Is that the CIA or something? <laughs> Are you interested? I can teach you at least 30 different ways to kill a man, Mr. Barris. The edge of your hand against your adversary's Adam's apple. Ew! Mr. Goldberg! Hi, Chuck. I have a hole in my daytime schedule. It's the Gong Show! It's a perfect cover. TV producer by day, CIA operative at night. Think of it as a hobby, something you do to relax. Thank you, Shane. I'm Chuck. Here you are, Chuck. Pleasantly surprised. Not like the other murders. When you lead two different lives, it's easy to forget what side you're on. Hey, All right, Penny, Patricia, how'd you find me? Are you serious? This is what I do for a living. What does she mean? That's what she you're does. You're dead for in my book. Do you want me around or not? Everything's complicated, Penny. You work for me. There's no backing out now. We let you in on everything. Drew Barrymore, George Clooney. Julia Roberts and Sam Rockwell as Chuck Barris. Look who comes out of hiding. Someone changed sides. It's over. It's finished. Your history. You're a dead man. That in and of itself feels like something from another universe. Yeah. Like, the amount of people that are in that movie, you would expect it to have made a bigger splash than it kind of has. You know, like there's not the cultural memory of that movie, I, I feel, is very similar to what our recollection of it is like, oh, yeah, that, that was a thing. I, I, I feel like I have vague, positive feelings about that, maybe. Yeah. I also love that, like, even though the movie is about a literal real person, it's about Chuck Barris, Sam Rockwell, he he's just Car Charlie Kaufman. Yeah. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. He's completely. like, let's, let's make a movie about this guy, but actually he's me. Yeah, yeah, completely. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know that I have a ton to say about the movie itself other than how weird it is that it exists. Um, but I do have stuff to say about Chuck Barris, the human, which we kind of alluded to earlier. Yeah, um, I, and bef I, I definitely do as well. Um, I, there was another thing I, I wanted to quickly talk about, and maybe this is even, maybe this is just where it's going to go, or maybe this is even something I might move back into act two. Uh, but before we get into Chuck Barris, there was kind of another thought that I was having because 
in you know with with the gong show aside from all the stuff that we've talked about our thoughts on it another thing that was talked about in some of the interviews and documentaries about the gong show or about chuck barris was this idea that a lot like even without the popsicle twins thing and the and and the you know flashing on on an episode uh the show was the show got a lot of blowback and a lot of criticism for being this sort of like lowest common denominator base debasement and like you know just regarded as like the the uh the dumbing down of of television and a, another criticism it got especially later on it, towards the end of it was this people saying that basically you know they were just mocking these people and it was and it was mean and cruel to have these people go on stage and make fun of them. And, um, you know, in, in some of the interviews and documentaries, a lot of people involved with the show were kind of like defending it on that front and saying that these people were like totally into it. And there was a couple, there was like one of the producers who was telling a story about how he was in response to that. He was saying like that multiple times a day, they would have contestants come in and turn in tapes to audition and they would say like, or no, they would come in and they would do an audition and they would tape it in the studio. And they would basically say like, oh, okay, well, we have your audition and we'll we'll contact you if we are interested. And then the people would be like, oh, like they would like the next day they would call and be like, did I get in? And they, they were like chomping at the bit, um, champing at the bit. That's the right phrase. Really? L- it's not. Mo- Chomping at the bit? It's champing at the bit. Really? Yeah, it's one of the... I, there's a name for it, but there's a there's a thing... First and foremost, it doesn't actually matter. I was joking. But there's a there's a name for something where there's a, there's a saying, and then there's another saying that people start using because it sounds like it should be right, but it's not actually right. There's a, there's a name for that, but it's, it's champing at the bit. I had no idea. I mean, you can chomp on food. Yeah, well, that's... Never the, heard- exactly, that's like... That people think it's chomping at the bit because that just sounds like it makes sense. Um, but anyway, so the and basically using that, it's like they they were like into it, like they they were like clamoring to get on the show. They they were in kind of using that as the as, as the reasoning for why it wasn't exploitation or that they weren't humiliating the people. And in a certain degree, thinking about that in a certain way, that's maybe a compelling argument. Like, yeah, they were they were really into it. They had fun. They kind of presented it as like they weren't mocking them. They were just it was just the celebration of just absurdity. There's these people doing these inc- crazy things and they were kind of all laughing at it and they were into it or whatever. Um, but I guess I was interested in what your thoughts on that were, because, you know, my my thought on that was like, in one sense, maybe that's true. Like they were they if that's if that's the case then they were really enthusiastic about it. Um, but then in another sense, especially with time especially especially with the benefit of time and kind of how we think about things now it's like you know these maybe they were into it but that's because we live in a society and culture that's obsessed with fame and celebrity and so these people are just like willing to do anything to get yeah, famous I mean, I think it, yeah i think it's completely that especially in viewed in the context of that there is no goodwill on this show no one is no one is being treated with respect no one is being put on a pedestal of look at what this person can do it's all punching down the, yeah. the, the everything on the gong show is base and and lowest common denominator by design like that's what it's supposed to do that's like that's like asking you know jackass to you know have some grander statement about the human condition it's, it's that's not what it's supposed to be i'm not defending it i'm not saying that we should you know celebrate jackass things or you know wild boys or any of those kind of like mid 2000s like almost you know let's pay people to watch them destroy their bodies for our pleasure style things but that that's what this that's what the gong show is completely like it's just how do we have the most crass commercial sen- sensibilities dial up to 11 the most lowbrow the most you know mean spirited but masked in a orchestrated chaos of we're not really being mean spirited because you know they they, they want to be here. It's the same thing as the William Hung segment from uh, 
that first season of American Idol where, well, he went there and auditioned. He did it to himself. Like, we can't help it if we laugh at him for being a terrible fucking singer. And he got a record deal out of it. He's fine. Like, yeah, I don't know, man. I don't know. And And that's that, like, viewing things through the lens of being famous or getting famous as this, like, objective goal that you should strive for in any in any respect where it's almost more disturbing if they were like yes daddy please more like like the the idea that they're on stage and they're and they're like they're 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 willing they're willing to do it they're into it because they just want the fame so bad that they're just like i'll debase myself gladly i'll 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 gulp it down like three barrels of bob barker's premium blend yeah Well, the other thing, too, that's so kind of sad about it is you can kind of track the emotional state of Chuck Barris based on these shows, you know, because, you know, he he has so much success so early on and then it leaves so so quickly. He's not a part of the dating show after you know only a couple of years and then he gets lost in the desert for a while and then is on the, the, the newlywed show. And then that is just like this huge success. And then lost in the desert for a while and then the gong show and then he's lost in the desert for a while and like it's this you know it's these huge peaks and valleys of just like maintaining cultural relevance as almost a war of attrition for him you know like it it's just you can feel his persona developing and taking hits and come and roaring back to life through the various arcs of this and i love the way he phrased that in that TV archives interview where he's like, yeah, I just kind of planned on banging out this book in two weeks. And then I just kind of got really into writing and like took it up as an art form and spent two years living by myself alone in a fucking hotel working on this book where I'm definitely not lying to you about being a CIA operative. Like even I went to see The Shining that weekend instead. (laughs) Right. Like, you know, that that tells you like he had this movie and it was this huge failure he was hoping it was going to rehabilitate his career yet again and it failed and he went and lived in a hotel for two years and licked his wounds and wrote about the person he wished he was you know he wrote a book yeah i think that's fabing who he wanted to be it's it's i think that's really the crux of it and it's 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 sad but it's also funny delving into the story and hitting that moment where you're like yep there it is because you know what one aspect of the so one aspect of the movie the gong show movie is that it was basically dovetailing into this period where the show was gonna get canceled because they had just worn out their good will by doing all these controversial things and there was heaping criticism and it was like it was gonna end like there was they were backed into a corner he had no more leverage to keep this objectively chaotic and insane show on the air and so the movie was kind of like the swan song of it of like, OK, fine, but I'm, we're going to make this movie or whatever. And it's going to be this goofy thing. And we're basically going to say, fuck you to this idea of the censorship of why the show is ending. And it was this sort of like it, it, it was this it was this processing of the the feelings that he had had for years where he was really starting to the 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 criticism and the the critics were starting to really get to him and he you know the we, the the trailer we watched it was uh, for the movie was a lot of just like weird gags and like shitty attempts at like monty python type sketches or whatever but there's also parts of the movie where it gets like weirdly serious and kind of introspective and it's just like this weird like self portrait thing where he's like interviewing himself and he's kind of like talking about how he feels like he doesn't want to like be pigeonholed as the gong show guy. And and it gets into this kind of, it touches on these weird dark spots where he's kind of talking about how he, he doesn't want to be remembered as this goofy idiot and he wants to be taken seriously. And that was in reaction to the, the consistent criticism that he had received for years that he was like, he was the father of like, of lowest common denominator, like the, the downfall of, of television as a serious art form or whatever. And so that that went into the movie and then the movie was this huge flop and also sort of concurrently along with all of this stuff his 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 family life had basically crumbled 
he he became estranged from his wife as he became more and more successful and they ended up getting a divorce and he became estranged not estranged but he was separated from his daughter who he was very close to in her younger age but then she moved away and they eventually reconnected she came to live with him again and then she started she was actually on the gong show she was like a regular character on the gong show she would come on and announce things and do songs with him and th- and stuff um but she also had been affected by the divorce and maybe some of the chaos of her home life and got into drugs and then she ended up kind of at a, at a younger age kind of when she was like 17 18 um she ended up leaving and going off and just going off on her own and she got really into drugs and then eventually she committed suicide tragically and so you have this guy who is he has this chip on his shoulder from years of being criticized for being this like guy who ruined TV and that he he's, you know, the figurehead of just like silly bullshit, meaningless detritus and really being bothered by that. And then he has this tragic event happen that he feels responsible for. He blames himself. And then and it all makes sense. It's like, oh, and then he crafted his own reality where he wasn't just the grandfather of silly det- bullshit detritus like trash TV in reality it was almost it's almost that power fantasy of like we we talked about it on the on the uh on the uh the Steve Ditko episode of just like that idea of Spider-Man where it's like it's not just oh I'm now I'm a nerd but now I'm strong and I can beat up my bullies it's like I'm a nerd I have these bullies but I have I'm so important that I can't reveal to them how strong I am. So I have to let them keep bullying me. But I know secretly that if I wanted to, I could just break this guy in half. And it's not even the power fantasy of getting revenge on your bully. It's the power fantasy of having the internal superiority against your bully that they are so unimportant and so weak that you don't even need to let them get the satisfaction or you don't even need to let them know that you are more powerful than them. Just knowing that you are is the satisfaction. And so he creates this world where he's like, yeah, you thought I was just some bullshit game show guy, but all that time I was secretly a fucking badass CIA agent who was going around just taking out enemies and it all clicks. And it's like, Oh, it's 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 interesting because it's it's it, it's retcon right like it's comic book logic he's like he's retconning his own story and saying like this was the secret that was happening this whole time all that stuff you didn't like well this is the reason behind that that makes all that stuff you didn't like stuff you now do like and also it's exactly what we were talking about earlier in the episode of like killing an alternate universe version of yourself or an alternate timeline choosing between music and TV, you know, choosing whatever. But his version of that wasn't even, Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have this immensely successful career as a musician. It was, he genuinely did apply for a job at the CIA. Didn't get it though. Like that, that's the the delineating factor. And like that for him is the, the ghost that he's chasing, right? That's the thing that was like, and if I had just not done any of this stuff, I could have had a quiet life. I could I could have, you know, had my privacy. I could have maybe kept my wife. I could have maybe, you know, been a better father. You know, all of these things could have happened in a different way if I had opted to not be in entertainment and opted to do this other style of work. Yeah, and and that justifies it better. Like to to imagine that he he's responsible for his marriage crumbling because he was so distracted by building a daytime television empire. And not only did his marriage deteriorate, but indirectly caused his daughter who he loved very much to become sort of troubled and fall into drugs, which ultimately led to just a life of battling drug addiction and then ultimately committing suicide. Um, and also, you know, because he was so busy with work, he just didn't mitigate that situation and he could have potentially intervened and done something to keep her from going off and leaving and falling deeper into drugs. But because he was just so busy with what he was doing, that just got away from him. So to look back on all of that and say, like, 
it's my fault that my marriage crumbled indirectly. It's my fault that my daughter fell into the life that she fell into. In, and then directly, it's my fault that she went off and, you know, really fell in deep into it. it it's kind of my fault that she's dead. It's it's my fault that all of these things fell apart because of this thing that I was focusing on. And then to look back on that and say that thing was the gong show. That's probably pretty fucking difficult to process and accept. But yes, you f- fucked up all those things. But it was because you were working for the CIA and you were like saving lives and protecting the country. Yeah, there was a there's a real reason behind it. It was a noble sacrifice. It wasn't just in pursuit of teenage girls licking popsicles. Yeah. And that's and that's it's so and it's so very sad because on one on one end of it, you're trying you're 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 trying to convince other people, which, you know, that's a little bit of an easier thing to do because. They don't know that it's true or not. And people most I'm I'm sure most people don't believe it. But like you can say that this happened and nobody will ever truly know, even if they do basically know. Um, but the saddest part of it is that is the internal kayfabe like that's the kayfabe. But the internal kayfabe where you go through the utterly futile effort and attempt at convincing yourself that it's true, even though you know that you will never think that it's true. And yet there's like two, there's like two layers of kayfabe going on inside of your own mind where you're like, if I just create this thing and I just keep telling myself that this is the thing, I can feel like that's the thing, but, I, but I'll never actually, but, but then, then the other layer is like, yeah, but like, it's not true, though. You know, it's not true. You fucking idiot. Well, you're... that's that's the thing, right? Is like they always, there's a there's a saying in wrestling of like you know that you're supposed to hang it up and stop stop being a wrestler when you've forgotten the line of what's a work and what's not a work. When you when you when you can't when you the wrestler have when you're not in control of your own kayfabe and you are like you've been consumed by the character. That's when it gets really dicey for a lot of guys. And I mean, the business practices in wrestling are horrible and they mistreat people but there's also a certain sense of self-inflicted destiny that happens with a lot of these older wrestlers because they forget when it's when it's a role and when it's them as the person you know yeah um and like there's one jake the snake interview i forget where i was watching this but there's a jake the snake interview where somebody is asking him like is jake the snake like are you are you a good father and he was like jake the snake isn't a father And then I don't remember his real name, but he's like, you know, so-and-so is a terrible father, but Jake the Snake just isn't one. Like, he's he's just not. And I, even though I have children, I just don't, I don't think about that. And like, that was so profoundly sad to me. Yeah. Where, you know, he, his character is who he is and the real life world is, it's not even a close second. It's a distant second to the world of, you know, the show, right? And I think that there's a lot of that crossover with Chuck Barris where he wants that. He wishes that he had that old school wrestling like I I have lost the line between what's real and not real because he's so unhappy with how things turned out in the real world. Even though objectively he's had an amazing career and uh, just a like w- the top 1% of 1% of people th- of their life. He got what everyone in America thinks is the dream. He has tons of money. He's probably slept with, you know, umpty dump dozen women or whatever you know i don't who knows how many women and he he's famous and people know him and he's recognizable but he's not happy and like that ultimately is like the, that's the real the real cancer you know yeah and i think i think that's the reason that's i think that's the reason why we fell into this thing of talking about kayfabe a lot because it it just i, I think it just happens to be the 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 weather by complete accident or whether there was some kind of purpose behind it or whether it was completely subconscious and subliminal that the 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 function and the logistics of what kayfabe is within wrestling is just like a blown up to like 20,000 feet hyper exaggerated form of just what the human condition is where you're constantly creating characters and projecting them out not only to everybody else, but to yourself constantly. That's what everybody always is doing. And the, the and, and, and the sad, and the sad thing is that 
the, you know, you you can you'll the the sad thing is that you'll never be able to actually immerse yourself in that kayfabe that you've created for yourself. You can you can create it for everybody else and have everybody believe it, but at the end of the day, no matter how successful you got, no matter how much you have bought into and accomplished that dream that we've all been sold about getting famous or having all this success, uh, particularly focused through the lens of fame in the entertainment world, which has been just unilaterally decided is like the pinnacle of being alive. At the end of the day, in your mind, you will never believe it. You can't convince yourself. Yeah, life's a work. Yeah. Which, which is depressing as fuck, but it's true. Like, it's it's life's a work. And unfortunately, <laughs> there's nothing any of us can do about it. Yeah. It's like the the concept of inception, where it's like you you, you have to go in and, and plant this idea at some, like, primordial level in somebody's mind for them to believe it. Like, that can't happen. Like, that's almost like the, the concept of inception is almost its own power fantasy because it's like, what if somebody, what if a, what if somebody could just go in your mind and just make you believe something that you want to believe? And, and you, you just, it, it obviously that doesn't exist. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, everybody's selling all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Oof. And that's the set. And that's the real, that's the thing that really gets to me. And I see, and I see it a lot in, in, I see it a lot everywhere all the time where I'm watching somebody saying, you know, saying something. And I'm like, I know, I know that you don't believe that, you know, that well some people i think do believe but it's like if you aren't a complete fucking idiot i know that you don't believe what you're saying you know that we know that you don't believe what you're saying and we know that you know that we know that you know that you don't believe what you're saying and yet we just you just you you continue on with this this like phantomic dance where you just commit to this thing that is not true that you don't believe and you know everyone doesn't think you believe because it's like the only thing you have because you, to admit that something isn't true would be to admit that your whole life was a waste of time or that you've committed yourself to something that's a lie or that you aren't what you project yourself to be or that you aren't going to accomplish the things that you want to accomplish or uh think you're going to accomplish or project yourself to ac accomplish so we just we commit to these things that we know are not true and so it's almost like we're it's almost like we're trapped in our own bodies just watching ourselves watching somebody else control our bodies because we can't just we can't just allow ourselves to acknowledge the reality and we and we we commit to these these fictions that almost become like prisons and that that's that's incredibly sad. Like the idea, sit, watching, watching, um, watching Chuck Barris sit there, and the interviewer just being like, "Yeah, so have you have you ever acknowledged whether or not you are a CIA? Yeah, these things in this book are true?" And him being like, "I've never answered it," and kind of like dancing around this thing. And it's like you can tell he's not like crazy enough to to like he's not baby Q level of crazy, where he will he will literally sit in a camera and weave you a tale of time traveling crime fighting and presented to you like it's a literal thing that's happening that's happened he'll he's not quite that crazy he's like dancing around it like i don't know i wrote it on this book but i don't know but it's which, just like it's which is interesting too because that interview was taken or recorded you know towards the end of his life you know after the movie came out i think that interview was from like 2009 and there's another interview that he did in the promo for the book's lead up in its release which i think we should watch i have sat in front of that gong in my yeah. sort of he was a regular contestant <laughs> no not a kid i was not a, a judge, contestant, but a yeah. judge. Yeah. Yeah. jt Big morgan difference. and me really right. gonged a lot of people so this is this is chuck <laughs> barris on the uh regis philbin <laughs> show uh with cindy garvey may 4th 1984 the game uh the dating game right. oh yeah, yeah they, a whole bunch of things there yeah they were they were uh they were fun we i enjoyed them. i mean i had fun doing them you know when the critics them. came down on you and said oh too much violence you're exploiting the uh, guests etc you said something very interesting about what they're seeing during prime time as opposed to your game shows oh i always i i never could understand why they would accuse us of violence and uh i thought our shows are pretty innocent i would look on 
on nighttime, and I'd see pistol whippings, rape, muggings, and I'd, you know, I, all our people were doing were, you know, running around with a lampshade on their head. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Sure. Well, you see these things in daytime too. <laughs> Constantly around my house. <laughs> but I, I really, in all, you know, in all honesty, I would, I really look back on our shows and wonder what that fear was about. Yeah. We would have an out take clip from the newlywed game stuff we couldn't show mm -hmm. and if you looked at it today you'd, you'd really wonder what was yeah. what were they talking about yeah. sure yeah. but then it drives you crazy after a while Chuck everybody wanting to come on all the attention I mean you used to go yeah. around in disguises right that's right <laughs> <laughs> yeah I was on my mark when uh, after about four years waiting for a commercial break and I said I remember standing there saying you know I don't think I'm having any fun anymore I, I think it's becoming a grind and uh, we quit just like that. Just yes, like that. <clears throat> Boy, and that was quite an empire that you were. Yeah, it was. Kind of it was from. kind of weird, but we took. I just took everything off, and I went off to write confessions. Mm -hmm. And I spent the, the last three years doing it. Is that right? Here in, in New York at the park. In New York, uh, but no, at the Wyndham. We came for a weekend and stayed. You know, my wife and I arrived for a weekend and just never left. And Is we, that right? Couldn't get a cab, huh? No. <laughs> <laughs> what else are you gonna do? <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. You can gong me at any time. Very good. No, that, that was wonderful. No. No, we, well, one one day we realized we moved here. You know, yeah. I, I mean, we had sent cartons of you know shirts, scarves, a couple sweaters, and one day we we were New Yorkers mm -hmm. again. You know? Well, now tell me about this book, uh, Chuck. The guy here sounds like you, has mm -hmm. done all the shows you did, and then has a another life, that oh, yeah. of a uh, CIA agent or operative, killer. Yeah, killer. <laughs> he was Sonny no, Six killer. I, that's right. I no, I. I had once applied for the CIA. I was accepted uh, up to, you know, a, an FBI check was in progress. And then I got a job with ABC, which is where I really wanted to go. I'd been out of work. And that thought always stuck in my head. I was never in the CIA, and I was never a killer, and uh, all that. But I kept thinking, after, you know, after these years went by, what if here's a guy who is crucified by the critics for entertaining uh, the public, and meanwhile he's getting covert and presidential citations for killing people. And this drives me or the character nuts. Mm -hmm. uh, I just love that juxtaposition. You know, you can. But Chuck, you know, Chuck, it could have happened because after all, the dating game, the newlywed game, with all these trips you would send people on mm -hmm. around the world, would be a right. great way, great cover for an operative to get into a. <laughs> yes, it was. Area. So it we was don't a know. Great cover. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's so, the fine line here. Chuck, you know, yeah. you've always been a little weird. If I can <laughs> say that with all great affection. affection. Who knows? Not what is weird. the true story here? here? Well, that's the the fun. The confessions is a. I I don't think it's a book you would imagine you were going to read if you picked it up. I think it, you, you'll get, you know, I have 20 years of, of stuff in there about all our shows, and it, and it has a, a strange, it is a novel, you know, it has a twist, it has a plot, but the people who work closely with me, you know, uh, Carruthers, my secretary, yeah. Loretta, all those people, they're the ones that don't know <laughs> whether it's, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the strangers, the uh, strangers, they know that. Yeah, now, has Hollywood picked up on this? Is this going to be a major film with James Caan and uh, Goldie Hawn? James Caan would be just right I to play. I think it would be terrific. Well, I just I, cast your I, I, Too flattering, <laughs> Chuck, but what the heck. <laughs> I like James Caan. I, uh, I don't think, uh, they they're actually, in truth, people are reading the book with an eye toward a movie, but I think they're afraid that I want to play the part. <laughs> 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 and, uh, well, you have I'm one trying to tell them, forget <laughs> about me. You know? It would be a great You movie. know, he told me about this. A few months ago, I had dinner with Dick Clark, mm -hmm. yeah. and he laid out the whole plot. It's held, held me spellbound across a restaurant table. I finally said, not Dick. Are you telling me this is true or it's not true? Dick said, I don't know. I don't know. And he's one of your closest friends. Very close. And uh, it's true. Okay. All right. Well, anyway, the Thank book you. is Confessions of a Dangerous Mind. It's a lot of fun. And uh, who knows if it's true. <laughs> he just fucking broke kayfabe in the middle of this interview. I just want a sitcom that is just Chuck Barris, Regis Philbin, and Dick Clark, like in, in like a Sex in the City style <laughs> show yeah where it's just them just hanging out going out to brunch what, you think yeah. I'm gonna say no you think I'm, you think I'm gonna say no to that <laughs> like, that, that sounds great <laughs> uh, but I mean I think that's a nice place to end it though because like that shows you the kind of it's not fucking real but that's also kind of the point because it's real for this guy it's like him writing almost kind of a, a eulogy for himself long before he was dead of what he wished he would have done and you know yeah and i think that that's everybody, even sadder than yeah, it being and, real and everybody does that but the, but most people don't have the opportunity to like write it in a book that gets published and then go on to the Regis philbin show and talk about it yeah like yeah, you know it, it, people do this in very in small degrees it, it, it could be anything from like oh 
I, you know, just making just whatever you, you get a, you get a, uh, there's like a scar on your arm because you got into a fight one time and you're not proud of it. So if anyone ever asks you about the scar, you say that you got it from like hitting your arm on a counter yeah. or something like that. Like yeah, something, yeah, yeah, something yeah. as small as that to like something as big as like I was in nine 11, like that one, the yeah, lead that one guy. comedian, that one comedian guy. Yeah. Um, totally. To something as big as I was a CIA assassin. Um, but most people don't have the opportunity to like canonize it into pop culture. Yeah, it's fascinating, and I feel like it's a a, a really weird, interesting character study. And um, R.I.P. Chuck Barris. R.I.P. I'm Dave Baker, and I'm Andrew Price. This has been Deem Comps. If you like to find me on the internets, heydavebaker.com or xdavebakerx. Uh, on all of the socials or if you're looking for i don't know maybe a little little bit of a funny papers a little graphic novel to get the young person in your life who is starting a love affair with the comics medium you should get them uh, night hunters (laughs) yeah night hunters or everyone is tulip or any of the other books that are out there everyone is tulip is available in bookstores everywhere just got named one of the top 10 graphic novels by library journal for 2021 which i'm ecstatic about uh very 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 trippy it's an honor to be named on that list um and so if you're looking for a book to get somebody everyone's tulip is out there as is night hunters and single issues andrew where can people find you on the internet you can find me stumbling around screaming throwing pies tripping wrestling with people screaming at the top of my lungs on stage performing in my pseudo postmodern game show But then when the lights go off and the audience leaves, a dark shadowy figure appears in my dressing room and hands me a manila envelope and speaks a password to me and leaves. And I open it up and it contains my instructions for my next mission. I'm assassinating a senator from Bolivia. And you can also find me at dapricerights.com where you can get my book, Deadbolt AI Private Eye. You can go to deepcutspod.com, click on the shop. You can get some Deep Cuts merch, t-shirts, fanny packs, hats, coffee mugs, get something for the Deep Cuts fan in your life for the holidays. If you want to follow us on social media, you can go to Facebook, Deep Cuts Podcast. You can join our Facebook group where we talk about the show, discuss episodes, make memes, talk about other random stuff. The Deep Cuts Podcast Facebook group. You can also join our Discord server by going to bit.ly.com slash Deep Cuts Discord. And uh, we talk about the show there. We have in-depth conversations about it. We have conversations about all kinds of different random stuff we also make memes uh you can follow us on instagram at deep cuts pod you can get a mystery treehouse investigation agency patch by going to deepcutspod.com and it's on the front page Deep Cuts is a production by Boy Genius Media. If you'd like to find this show and others like it, please visit boygeniusmedia.com or deepcutspod.com. If you want to join in on post-episode discussions, please join the Deep Cuts Podcast Facebook group. Finally, subscribe to our YouTube channel for additional video content. Eight ball in the meta pocket. All right. Ah, shit. That's the 69th game in a row you've won. This is bullshit. You gotta admit, VR billiards was a great idea. I I can't I can't lie. Initially I was like VR billiards, but now I'm like VR billiards. Dear God, can you guys please shut up? I don't know how you could be standing in an empty room and still be too loud for me to be watching fucking Planet of the Apes in the other room. Well, is it because you you are like the Grinch and you can't stand people being happy and living their full lives and enjoying themselves to the, the utmost of their abilities hillsmer what's the grinch uh, you want to you want to play again yeah i mean what else what else are we doing all right cool let me let me hit this restart button and greetings citizens of purgatory 7 we are now getting breaking news from the scene that a group of what looks like hooded fish monsters are invading the city capital. It, it's it's pure pandemonium. Ah, oh god! My leg is on fire!
Oh my god! This is horrible! The building is in ruins? That one person's leg is on fire? Oh my god, I've never seen so many ones of legs on fire. Yeah, it's weird that that just the one person... I, it's almost like I don't think it was the fish people that did that. I think that's unrelated. Oh my god, is that a jet crashing into the Capitol building? What the fuck is going on? Wait a minute, Dave. What? Those things look familiar. Those fish monster things. Aren't those... Aren't those 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 henchmen cultists in Chuchiwuchi's secret laboratory? Oh my god. Uh, computer, freeze frame. Enhance. 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 En enhance. Fuck, enhance. This is really tiring. This is really... We gotta enhance far for this one. Enhance. Alright, there we go. Look at what the... Andrew... Look at what that flag says. Wait, no, my my prescription is a little outdated. A computer, enhance. Okay, now, okay, cool. I can see it now. The, the Black, Black Millennium, Millennium Society? Society? 